All right, welcome everyone. Um, I am excited to welcome you to the third uh, video in our or third session in our Knowledge Translation Field School. Um, this round, we have Jane Morris from Brock University, who's back with us. Uh, if you watched, uh, if you participated in the first ones or have watched the recording, uh, she kicked off our session. So I'm excited to have Jane back. And we also have Larissa, Larissa Roden, who is a graduate student here at Brock. Um, and they've been doing a bunch of work on uh, creating resources around graphical abstracts. And so uh, they've got a ton of cool resources for us. Um, and I'm really excited to welcome them here for this session um, and to see some of the, the cool tips and tricks and resources that they've got for us. Um, so as I said before, and as I've introduced these different ones, um, please feel free to throw any questions or things you have in a chat. I know that these two have some fun uh, activities um, and kind of uh, working pieces built into the activity activities for us today. Um, so if you do have questions throughout, feel free to jump um, in the chat. Um, if you have any specific questions or logistical problems, you can reach out to me. Um, I believe uh, you have my contact information there or I'll be on this chat as well. Um, and just so everybody knows, we are recording uh, and we will be publishing this after. So if you don't want to be included on the recording, uh, just uh, remind you to keep your camera turned off. Uh, that's that's totally fine. Um, and, but we will have the opportunity to, to participate through the chat as well if you don't want to be recorded that way. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you two and uh, you can kick things off. All right. Let me know if you can see that. Yeah, we're good to go. Okay, perfect. Okay. So I guess I am quickly starting with a little intro. So welcome everyone. We're going to talk about difficult abstracts and visualizations. Um, agenda for today, like we're going to go a little bit, what is uh, knowledge visual, visual, visualization? What is a graphical abstract? We'll talk a little bit about how to actually create one, an overview, review some practical considerations, like what program do I use to do this? Like, am I drawing this out and scanning it? Like, how does this work? Where to start? Uh, graphic designs, tips and tricks, sharing on social media, and then we'll actually walk through a full example. When I say we, the majority of this is Larissa. I literally have one slide and then I will turn off my mic. Um, but that's what we're working through today. There's going to be a lot of activities throughout that uh, Larissa's built in. Uh, we're going to be using the chat for that. So make sure you've got your chat box up or ask some questions. Also feel free, like if you want to unmute to raise your hand to answer a question or talk through something, totally fine as well. Um, we're going to start with a really quick reminder about what all of this is, uh, which is knowledge translation or knowledge mobilization. Um, and the practical term definition is that this is, it's very much a dynamic and iterative process that includes the synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge. Knowledge mobilization is the movement of knowledge typically that is um, created through research into active use, right? So you, you've done research, you have this amazing knowledge, how do you actually get it out there so that people can use it? Uh, that is knowledge mobilization. That's knowledge translation. What we're going to be talking about today is one specific aspect of it. The it's easy to know what this is, but then the big question is: okay, how how do the, how the heck do I mobilize? One way that you do this is through knowledge visualization, um, which is what this whole session is about. And now I'm going to turn it over to Larissa to take you through what that means and uh, how you can do it. Okay, hey, awesome. Thank you, Jane. Uh, and sorry if I sound a little stuffy or if I have to. Uh, take a break to cough. I'm getting over COVID, so I'm going to try and mute myself when I have to cough, but I might forget. <laughs> um, but so starting with knowledge visualization. So I think the best way of summing this up is a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, so knowledge visualization is the use of visual depictions to effectively convey or disseminate knowledge from one person or group to another. So essentially, Knowledge visualization assists in creating new knowledge in a way that's really innovative and creative. And this can really help ease communication between researchers in the community and between researchers across different disciplines by providing more effective communication that's gonna work across language and other demographic barriers. So visualizations can help reduce the cognitive load and enhance processing abilities by visualizing these, um, in some cases really made maybe really abstract relationships. So knowledge can be more easily externalized and interpreted um, or an overview of a really large field of interest can be provided more quickly and easily. So some examples of knowledge visualization include cave paintings going way back. This would be an example of knowledge visualization. Um, graffiti or artwork can be a form of knowledge visualization. 
even the periodic table. Um, so lots and lots of different ways of looking at this and just wanted to get things going, get people involved. Um, so using the chat box, we're gonna have some prompts throughout this, throughout this session um, that I'm hoping people will get involved in. So if you wanna use the chat box now, what other examples of knowledge visualization could you think of just off the top of your head? I don't know if Jane, if you could monitor the chat, that would be awesome. Just so I'm not flipping. Yeah, we've got, forth. this is an awesome one uh, from Laurel, uh, cycling lanes, which is actually really, it is not oh, that is, that yeah. is really smart. Uh, poster charts, road signs. Awesome. So yeah, everybody totally gets it. The cycling lane is an awesome one. Never would have thought of that. Oh, so thank you guys for participating. Um, so naturally, we can definitely see how graphical abstracts fall into that and how they can be really beneficial in communicating these really complex topics in a way that's going to be so much more digestible and easy to understand. So starting at the very beginning, though, what exactly is a graphical abstract? So this is a single image that appears alongside your written abstract. And the viewer should be able to really quickly and easily pick up on the main idea and the key outcomes of the article. Um, it's also really important to note, I think, that graphical abstracts can have many uses. So for the sake of this session, we're focusing more on journal submissions, but you could use graphical abstracts for really any kind of formal presentation, um, scholarship or grant applications, conference presentations or abstracts. Um, you could also see graphical abstracts on social media, and we'll get into that a little bit, but using it on social media as a way of drawing more attention to an article or to a key finding. Um, you might even see graphical abstracts come up in more traditional print sources, so different pamphlets or magazines or newsletters even. And just some examples what graphical abstracts might look like. So you could have something like this, um, where you've got like the three different panels and um, minimal text. Something more like this that you'd see like as a conference poster. It could look like this. Or this could look like this, where you're reading that left to right, kind of more of a um, flow chart taking you through different steps. Um, again, another example of kind of a flow chart, different styles, different elements that are being used in each one. And then moving away from the sport field a little bit, but here's some examples of graphical abstracts, abstracts in different areas. Um, so this one reading like top to bottom. This one super simplified really keeps it straight to the point so you can see exactly what you need to but still giving that overview and then it could even look like this in some cases so this one done like a comic strip and i think this just really goes to show and reiterates this idea that there's no one right way of creating a graphical abstract there's so many different styles and ways of doing it and ultimately the right way is going to depend on you what message that you're trying to convey with your graphical abstract and how you feel comfortable conveying it. So there's no cookie cutter way of creating a graphical abstract, but there is some general guidance that'll help you figure out the best method of creating one that's gonna work for you. Um, so that's hopefully what this session is gonna help guide you through a little bit more is figuring out the right way of going about it for you. The effect, so the effectiveness of a graphical abstract depends on how well it's done. And this is something that as scientists, we really don't receive a lot of explicit training on how to do. It tends to be more of a figure it out as you go. Or like Kyle said, you get to the last stage of submitting and it says, oh, you can submit a graphical abstract, but you haven't given it a single thought until this point. Um, so figuring it out as you go is fine to some extent and something that I think probably as scientists, we're pretty good at doing already, but it definitely, definitely helps to put some practice in and really build this skill because the use of effective graphical abstracts is something that's becoming uh, much more valued and increasingly important to knowledge translation and mobilization and just science communication in general. So this is because many journals are beginning to recommend a graphical abstract with submission. So you might have that option to include one, but then in other cases, there's some that are even requiring it now. It's also important to do what we can to make our knowledge more accessible to more people. 
And graphical abstracts are a really great way of doing this, considering we can take what might be a really complex article in a really niche field and then provide this really clear snapshot summarizing it in the form of a picture. Can also be really useful for conferences or other presentations by again supplementing and facilitating the understanding of a complex term or concept that you're explaining. So coming back to that idea that a picture is going to be worth a thousand words. You can use it for grant or scholarship applications, even in participant result summaries, you could always include a graphical abstract that again will give that individual that really clear snapshot of the overview of what you were doing and why you were doing it. So graphical abstracts can also draw more attention to your published article. Um, especially since these are captured within search engines as images. So really great, um, great tip there that I didn't know before getting involved in this, that they were actually captured as images. It puts your research into that instantly more usable or digestible format. And for you specifically, it can be used in your portfolio or dossier as a knowledge translation activity. So it'll look great on a CV. Um, and then as a reader too, not on the slide here, but as a reader, I know that graphical abstracts can really help you um, more quickly and like easily identify papers that are of interest to you or relevant to you when you're doing a literature search. <clears throat> so according to the, to the literature, graphical abstracts make your research more accessible and understandable. It also leads to increased dissemination on social media as well as greater online engagement. So there's really no drawbacks to including one and learning how to do one effectively. Overall, um, being able to create graphical abstracts, just a really great skill to have in academia and especially for science communication. So just interested um, with the group that we have here, if you wanna throw a yes or no in the chat, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, how many of you have actually created a graphical abstract before? I'm getting nopes. Nope, 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 nope. Lots of no's. Okay, so lots of no's. It's okay. So the wasn't good, timing. but yes. We have a wasn't good, but yes. <laughs> okay, I like the disclaimer there. Yeah. Okay, so the next question then that I had for you. Um, so we had a lot of notes. The first part doesn't really apply. Um if you have well actually for before. christine i'd like to know for christine that wasn't good but yes what was the hardest yeah. part christine what did you uh, find the hardest part no. and if you haven't what made you one if you haven't made one before what do you think would be the hardest part or knowing you what do you think you'd struggle with the most it was just my first one so obviously <laughs> trying trying to put your entire master's thesis that you you know spent like a year and a half on into like one picture and i don't know you know theses are already bigger than sometimes bigger than regular projects. So it's trying to tr put a whole year and a half work, years of work into one picture where you try to simplify it as much as you can, but you wanna say more, but you can't say more. And of course, when it's your first one, it's not pretty anyways, no matter how good you are with Canva, so. Yeah, it's, it sounds like that, that um, if any of you were at the first session, it's getting it down to that smit, your single most important thing that you have to get to, which is hard, right? Uh, and then the two comments that we've had are very similar. It's uh, finding a platform to create it, knowing how to use the platform. I think I would struggle with using a computer program to create art, making it look professional and creative. Um, people are agreeing on the simpli simplification point, peeling back those technical terms, right? We have been taught to use the jargon that is in our field. We, we have to. And then suddenly we're telling you to not use it anymore. Um, People are saying I would probably struggle with balancing between making it engaging and creative, but still professional looking. Um, I would spend one million nine hundred thirty-four or six hundred eighty-four hours um, storyboarding and never actually get anywhere. Um, I feel you on that one. You, I draw them out first, and then it just goes from there. But those are those are the struggles that we're seeing coming in so far, Larissa. Awesome! Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, definitely all valid. Um, definitely hope that this intro helps you at least maybe feel a little less intimidated by some of these concepts. Um, but also want to take the second 
um, with that to kind of plug these science communication modules that we've been developing over at the Brock uh, VPMI. Um, so we've created three different modules focusing on different science communication skills and graphical abstracts is one of them. Um, there's also lay writing and podcasts. But so this session right now is a quick overview to kind of get you started with your graphical abstract. But with these modules that we have really gives a in-depth full step-by-step -step breakdown um, that goes into a ton of detail. So modules are going to be available early 2023 and just wanted to make sure I, I plugged those while, while I'm here. Um, but this is the part um, that I'm sure you're all here for is how to actually get started with creating a graphical abstract. Um, so if you have a manuscript or paper with you, I know that was in the description, if you wanted to bring one along with you um, and get started, you can start thinking about that now, making some notes, um, thinking about how what we're talking about is going to apply to you and creating your own graphical abstract. So anyways, when it comes to starting to create this graphical abstract, really, really great starting point is to simply look at examples. And it sounds so basic, such a simple starting point, um, but it really is like the place to start, I think, in my opinion, at least, um, especially since we're all here with different backgrounds um, in different research areas. We're all submitting to different journals with different recommendations or requirements when it comes to the graphical abstracts. Looking at examples within your niche fields of research and examples from the journal that you're planning to submit to, it's a really great place to start. Um, but when you're taking the time to look at those examples, make sure you're really actively looking at them. And what I mean by this is to really pay attention to the style of graphical abstract that's used, uh, the different elements that are being used and consider things like, what do you like that you're seeing? What don't you like? What do you definitely know that you wanna avoid when you're making your own? Um, what's catching your attention right off the bat and what's keeping your attention as you look at it? <clears throat> What do you find is really effective in facilitating your understanding when you're looking at a graphical abstract? And then on the other hand, is there anything that you find really confusing or hard to read or you're looking at it and you're like, I just, I have no idea what this is telling me right now. Ultimately, just paying attention to everything when you're looking at some examples, um, writing down some notes about what you would like to include or avoid in your own graphical abstract and really thinking about why or why not. Um, really just what's going to work for you. What are you seeing that would work for you? And what would you definitely want to stay away from? <clears throat> so with that first little, little exercise just for you, um, if you want to take a couple minutes to leave, not actually leave the Zoom call, but um, open another tab and even just a quick Google image search of your general research area, followed by graphical abstract could pull up some results. Um, but finding some graphical abstracts related to your field. So if you know any journals that um, publish them, you could start there looking at that. Um, but again, even just a Google image search works. If you wanna find a graphical abstract and just take a really close look at it, or you could browse a few different ones to get a more general idea, totally up to you. Um, but I just wanna take a little bit of time to go look at some graphical abstracts within your specific field and really pay attention to how they're done. So make notes of any common elements that you see that stick out to you. And that could be good or bad. Um, so maybe so we'll take about like, five minutes for that, yeah. maybe five minutes. So we'll come back at 126. And like literally, like I just Googled concussion graphical abstract and tons came up. So pick one, the broad topic area, and we'll see you all in five minutes and then have a little chat about that. We need waiting room music now, Rosa. We didn't plan some for elevator that. music. Yeah.
Um, someone's asking, are there any alternative words, uh, names for graphical abstracts, Larissa? The only one I've really come across is visual abstracts. So yeah, it really depends on the field too, I think. And if you are really struggling to find some for your field specifically, maybe just broaden it out a little with that Google search. And then uh, the same person, are they different from infographics? Which I, my response would be kind of maybe a little bit, like I would say they're a form of infographic, but much more specific to like this article. And like, the, I'd say sometimes they're a little bit more scientific than an infographic. Like there, I would say they're a form of an infographic. Would you agree, Larissa? Yeah. Yeah. I would say that that's totally right. Cause the graphical abstracts always going to accompany, um, a written abstract. So typically for the journal submission. Um, so something that I'll probably get into a little bit later, but like when you're thinking of a lay audience, more than a scientific audience that you want to target, um, an infographic might be a little bit more up your alley um, because you can bring in more context, more background information and make a lot more connections than you can within that graphical abstract specifically. I also appreciate that someone shared in the chat a graphical abstract on the use of therapeutic clowns in hospitals. <laughs> and it's a wonderful graphical abstract. I also, I've watched Patch Adams. I know this exists. So this is awesome. Thank you, Christine. Christine, is this the graphical abstract you made? I know you said you made Absolutely one. Absolutely not. <laughs> Could you imagine? I was suddenly very excited to learn about your research. Not that I'm not still, I still am, but like very excited. This is awesome. Cool. Okay. We are, uh, we're back. We're, we are at the, the five minute mark. Awesome. Okay. So I hope everybody was able to find something. Um, so the next question we're going to lead into. So what stands out to you from the examples that you looked at? Good or bad? Any common elements that you're seeing come up over and over again? Um, if you want to just throw it all in the chat. And I see Emily raised her hand. So Emily, no, don't put it. Unmute, Emily. Be courageous. It's always easier for me to, to speak than, than to type. Um, I, I work in two fields. I work in uh, sports sociology and then in injury prevention with road safety. So kind of two, two different worlds. So I looked up both and I just noticed a really kind of interesting difference between the searches I got from um, searching, you know, graphical abstracts with each of those titles and like the sport ones tended to be like way more colorful, a lot of overlapping images to like simulate movement with like little text. And then when I looked at the injury prevention ones, it's more like instructions right or like you know these boxes with heavy text and a little busier and like less color um so that was kind of the first kind of takeaways um from what i what i got from my searches awesome. i like the color personally uh, like i was drawn to that like my visual cortex says ooh i want to right so it's just interesting experience thanks for the opportunity and it's to interesting that it's with road safety i used to work in road safety and like there's so many things you can do with like the use of like the road yeah. visual, right? Mm -hmm. Got to be creative there. Um, so we're seeing uh, someone wrote uh, title and uh, rectangular sections are helpful. Cycling uh, graphics are less helpful as you don't know where to start. Um, color makes a difference. Large numbers to draw attention to key findings, definitely. Um, and then there seem to be two kinds, ones that look like infographics and then others that are single images that depict more complex ideas and relationships. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, like it's totally going to depend on your field and the journal. You can see what's kind of common um, in different fields, like like you were saying before, um, the injury prevention versus the sports side, to two totally different styles. Um, and that's great. Like different fields are going to have different things. But by looking at those examples, you can kind of see what's what's already been done in, in my area. And when I'm making my own graphical abstract, what kind of elements do I want to draw on? And then at the same time, how can I make my own stand out? So maybe with that injury prevention field, you wanna bring in a lot more color, 
but still keeping those those boxes maybe um, with more text heavy um, preventative information, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so I did want to share this little list with you. So um, like I said before, no right or wrong way of creating a graphical abstract, but there are some good rules of thumb or common elements that are relatively consistent no matter what field you're in. Um, and I'm sure a lot of these are things that you probably already picked up on just by doing that quick look at the graphical abstracts within your own field. Um, so you obviously you want to try and catch your reader's attention. So you can do this with your use of symbols, icons, color, um, the text as well, whether that's um, different colors for different words or um, bolding, even just trying to minimize the text to draw attention to images or different concepts. Um, and then at the same time, though, you want to make sure that you're avoiding those hard to read or any overcomplicated fonts. So in a lot of cases, the journal that you're submitting to might even give you explicit instructions as to which fonts are acceptable or not. So really important to check out those, those guidelines and whatever the journal says ahead of time. Um, you definitely want to create an original image. Um, so something that does happen probably too often is just using an exact copy of a figure that's already within the paper and just slapping that on and calling it your graphical abstract. Um, the issue with this is that there's no context to those figures. So you might find some really great, really cool results, um, but just throwing the stat, the figure that has your stat summary as your graphical abstract is going to be pretty meaningless to your viewer um, because at first glance, they have no other context. They don't know what any of those stats actually mean. Um, so even if you're on a time crunch, say you have a deadline to submit your article tomorrow, and you just realize that a graphical abstract is required, even if it's the most basic thrown together graphical abstract, just take that little bit of time to make sure it's still an original image and not just a copy and pasted figured figure. <clears throat> um, you wanna try, it, keep, try to keep it simple where you can and having that meaningful and logical layout. Um, so whether it's being read left to right or top to bottom, however, however you want or however makes sense, make sure, making sure that there is just some sort of logical flow for your eyes to follow. So I know so it was mentioned, somebody um, said the cyclical one seemed a lot more confusing. So when you're creating your own, you would totally want to stay away from that. Um, or if that is what makes sense for the research that you're doing, just making sure that there is something clear, letting the reader to know, letting the reader know, start here. Um, but with all of that, you want to be very aware of information overload too. So too many elements are just going to confuse your readers. It's going to muddle your message and just won't really get anything from the graphical abstract. <clears throat> so the next step after you've looked at those examples and you kind of have a rough idea of what a successful graphical abstract should look like in your area. Next step is to figure out exactly what message you want to convey with your own graphical abstract. And I think for me, this would probably be the hardest part is figuring out exactly what I want to say. I have this one little snapshot to give people what's going to be that most important thing that I want people to take away from this. And a couple concepts that might help you figure this out are BLAM and SMIT. Um, so if you haven't heard of these before, BLAM is your bottom line actionable message. Um, so what does your article ultimately tell people to do or know? And then there's your SMIT, so your single most important thing. So what's the one major take home message from your article? Um, so thinking about these concepts and maybe whether or not there's any overlap between your bottom line actionable message and your single most important thing, because they can be the same, same message, but they definitely don't have to be. They can be two different things. Um, but thinking of these two different concepts can be a really good starting point to figuring out what your key message is, what you want to focus on with your graphical abstract. So what is the one thing that you want your readers to take away from this graphical abstract? You have a very short window of opportunity that they're going to look at this graphical abstract. So what do you want them to see from that? Doesn't have to be a full summary of the results. And that's really important to keep in mind because you could have tons of numbers and um, analyses that came out of this, but what is the one key takeaway? Um, so a good way of looking at this could be thinking of it 
Um, like, do I want, when people look at my graphical abstract, do I want my readers to know something? Do I want my readers to do something? Or is it kind of a combination? I think that people should know this so that they do that. And whatever you do decide on, the message should be easily identifiable. And if you are still struggling with this, something that I found helps me um, was just asking myself, so what? So when I think I have my main message, so what? And then can you still go further? And then just keep asking yourself until you can't really come up with another so what. You found that, that finally distilled message. Um, considering too, if there's anything unique about your study, because this is something that you might want to portray in that graphical abstract too. Perhaps you use some really novel methodology or you had some really unexpected results that just would never have expected in a million years in this area. Um, really what's setting your study apart from similar studies in the area. And thinking of all these things is what's really gonna guide your content creation when you're creating this graphical abstract. So if you're stuck at any point, you don't really know what to do next or um, how to get started, where do I go from here? Keep coming back to that main message. So you've looked at examples, um, you have an idea of what your main message is gonna be. How do you wanna convey it now? Um, so how are you gonna format your graphical abstract? Um, you have that main message, but how do you effectively convey it to your readers? So we know already that there should be some sort of logical flow to this graphical abstract, but again, how you set that up is totally up to you. So you could do something that reads top to bottom, left to right, uh, more of a flow chart, um, you could do something cyclical if that's what works for you, but a lot of it will depend on how complex the message is that you want to try to convey. Um, could also use the panel approach, like somebody mentioned, lots of different panels to separate different elements. Um, could use that cartoon or comic style like we saw earlier. So tons of different options for you, whatever is going to work best for you or that you're comfortable with. Everything's super, super customizable. Um, but ultimately, when you're thinking about how you want to convey this message, you really, really need to consider your audience. So who are you targeting with your article? Um, and as such, who are you targeting with your graphical abstract? Are you focusing just on other researchers within this area? Or are you trying to get to a more lay audience? Because this is going to affect how you, how you lay things out, how you create that graphical abstract. Um, <clears throat> If you're pretty much just concerned with reaching other researchers, so people who have the pre-existing knowledge of this area, then when you're creating your graphical abstract, you don't really need to shy away from certain jargon or complex concepts that are gonna be easily understood by people who already are in this area. Um, but if this is an article that you think maybe has some valuable implications or knowledge that you really wanna make sure reaches a more general or lay audience, Maybe you even have plans already to share this graphical abstract on Twitter or LinkedIn to reach this kind of an audience. Um, then you definitely need to be more mindful of the accessibility of the graphical abstract and the language that's used within it. So with that, you'll also have to think about the different elements that you want to use to convey that message. So are you going to include charts or tables to present results on it? But again, being aware of information overload, um, photos, symbols, different icons. Um, or diagrams or more conceptual frameworks that you wanna include. So there's tons and tons to think about here. Um, but if you keep coming back to your main message and thinking of your audience, those two things should lead you in the right direction. <clears throat> so once you have all that, one of the first practical things that you're gonna have to consider is what the heck am I gonna use to get this graphical abstract made? What program I'm, am I gonna use? And there are tons of free programs out there. There's tons of subscription-based programs out there. Um, a few examples that I have here. So PowerPoint, this would be one that would be super easy to use. Most of us are already really familiar with this and it's good for simplistic design. So basic shapes, text, diagrams. But if you have a really complex topic, might not be the best, best idea. <clears throat> Keynote, really similar to PowerPoint for Apple users. Um, BioRender, this is a subscription-based one. 
that contains a huge, huge collection of icons and symbols specific to life sciences or biomedical research. Um, Canva and PictoChart, these are um, relatively easy to use graphic design platforms. There's free versions and subscription base where the subscription, subscription will get you access to more symbols or icons. <clears throat> um, Adobe Illustrator, so there is a purchase required for this one, but there are free trials available. Can create really, really high quality images with this, but it does require a much more advanced understanding of how to use the application. So this is one where if you've never used it before and you have this huge time crunch on you to get this graphical abstract done, probably gonna stay away from this. Um, Adobe InDesign too is a really good one, really much simpler to use than Illustrator um, in terms of executing designs. So it'd be a really great option with less of a learning curve. Um, again, though, there is a purchase required, but there are short free trials available. Um, so lots that you could play around with. <clears throat> um, so really comes down to balancing the amount of time that you have and how much of a learning curve you're willing to put up with. Um, so if, for example, it's a really last minute thing, stick with a program that you already know. You don't need that added stress of learning a brand new program. It might not be the best in terms of images or um, the kind of elements that you need, but it's what's gonna work to get this done. If time isn't an issue though, and you're willing to spend a little bit more time learning how to use um, a different program or playing around a little more tweaking things, then try, try something else that might be more in line with, your, with what you need. So exploring a little bit, um, <clears throat> just going to the websites for each of these will give you a really good overview of the kinds of images that you can create and figuring out exactly what it is that you need to create the best graphical abstract um, for your information should definitely become clearer once you do have that main message. So again, there's no right program. It's about using what works best for you. Um, so quick question, if you have created a graphical abstract in the past, what program did you use? You know, I think somebody mentioned Canva already. Yeah, we've got a Canva in the chat. Or I would say even if like if you've done, because I have people asking, like, what about an infographic? Have you done even an infographic or any kind infographic of Infographic or posters? We've got Canva and PictoChart, uh, Ben Gage for infographics, Canva, mm -hmm. PowerPoint, Canva. Okay, hey, awesome. Those so Can Canva would be my my program of choice just based on the fact that I've used it before. I know there's lots of images. And that's one that if you want to get that subscription or pay a little more to have more access, it is pretty cheap. Um, even if you just get like a one month trial and then cancel it when you're done. Yeah, I like also that you can try it out like with some features before you decide to, to pay for it, which is nice. Yeah, exactly. Is, is there somewhere that you can go for royalty-free images and icons? Yes, there is. Stay, Larissa, tuned. Right on? Stay <laughs> tuned. Kyle, you are right on track with where this is going. Um, so the next practical consideration I just wanted to go over was starting with a rough draft. So again, something that sounds super, super basic, um, but is really important because there really there likely will be and there probably should be more than one draft of this to really get the best graphical abstract that you can. Um, so I have found that hand drawn rough drafts are the best place to start for me. So even just jot notes, trying to map out like the major thing that I want to include and trying a bunch of different little things just to see how it all looks, because it's much easier to make these changes on paper with a pencil than it is in one of these programs. Um, so again, at this point too, another important thing to consider would be to make sure you're collaborating with your co-authors. So more ideas, even at this rough draft stage, more ideas, more eyes on it, ultimately help make it the best that it can be. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so what about jargon? This is something that comes up a lot too. Um, and again, really is going to depend on your audience. So if you're submitting this um, to a journal and that's really the extent of it. You don't plan on sharing it online. You just want it to accompany your journal article. Scientific jargon's okay. And it's often gonna be unavoidable. 
Um, but again, all really depends on your audience. And that's something that you're ultimately going to have to decide for yourself, the extent of what the extent of how much jargon you want to include, what terms are okay versus what's not. And if you're really, really unsure, a great, um, really easy thing to do is to ask somebody who's not in your field. Show, show the graphical abstract to them, ask them about this term and just see where they are, they're at with it. And then you can kind of go from there. And not with just with graphical abstracts either. I think it's worth saying like any kind of science communication activity or knowledge translation, mobilization activity, the language you use is going to be a huge part of how accessible this is. Um, so just keeping that in mind, how accessible you want this to be. So another quick exercise. Um, so in your specific field, what is one of the most complex terms or out there concepts that you can think of? Um, and before you put that in the chat, the next part of this question is going to be, how do you think you could simplify this? So if you want to put that in the chat, whatever this term is or concept, and then trying to, to explain it in a little bit of a more lay way. Um, so a good way you could pretend that you're explaining it to your neighbor down the street who has no experience in this area at all. So we're getting ethics, morality, epistemology, discourse, flow state. Oh, I, Laura, I love that you study flow state. That's one of my favorite topics. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so I don't know what a bunch of those mean. Oh, functional near infrared spectroscopy measuring brain activity with light, which is measuring brain activity with light. Christine, I would like to see that graphical abstract now. Um, <laughs> okay. So does anyone want to try like simplifying their, their complex term? Oh, Emily. I'm happy to go again, unless someone else would like to share using their voice. <laughs> go for it. And others, maybe you'll encourage others to raise their hands. <laughs> so the, the ethics and morality stuff, um, I, again, trying to think of like how you'd present this in simple language. You could do like a good, bad and like a color associated with that, but it's also important to have like the, it depends in the middle. So um, to kind of show, kind of the subjective morality within this like larger framework of black and white and how we kind of negotiate that. So that's my first thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Kyle for discourse is the unwritten part of language, what the text we produce tell us without explicitly saying it, what we can only see when we read between the lines. I actually, A, love this because it's a great explanation, but B, it shows how sometimes plain language communication is actually a lot longer, right? Jargon is jargon because it's a bunch of concepts pushed into one word, right? And so a lot of people find, they think when we're talking about plain language communication or simplifying, oh, it's going to be shorter, right? Like we're simple. It's that smit, right? That one thing. It's actually typically a lot longer to communicate in plain language because you have to draw that out and pull all those nuances out and provide the examples, which is also another thing I love that you did there, Kyle, like reading between the lines, giving like explicit examples to make it tangible for people. Yeah, that's awesome. And just to add to that too, like, um, like Jane said, like the plain language is oftentimes going to be so much longer than that one term. So if you really do want to target a lay audience, thinking outside of just graphical abstracts, so an infographic in that case, where you can go into more detail and explain these terms, because you really don't have that much space with your graphical abstract to, to write all of that. How do you represent that as like a single image or symbol um, or really minimal text? So lots of different things to consider. Um, so the next thing would be the use of images, symbols, and icons in that. So again, being really aware of trademark or copyright, can you use those images? And then if you're going to publish those in a journal, can you still use those images? Um, so being really, really mindful of this, and this can be hard to navigate, um, hard to figure out, can I use this? Um, so these are a few re um, websites where there are those royalty free, you can use the free images. Um, no worries there. So definitely share that with you. You'll have it in the recording too. 
um, but just some great sources. Another thing to consider is your technical requirements. Um, so with your journal submission, what are the requirements as you submit it? A lot of times it's gonna require that your graphical abstract that you're submitting is in its final form. So you're submitting just the file with that graphical abstract. It's not um, like the graphical abstract pasted into a Word document or on a blank background. It's just that final ad abstract. Um, so again, just double checking those requirements. Um, it'll often lay out requirements with sizing or the acceptable file types. Um, when it comes to sizing, there's usually a way when you um, save as that you can you can manipulate that depends on the program too. usually a quick Google search can tell you. Um, if not, you can always reach out to the IT department with your um, organization. And then same with acceptable file types, lots of free converters online too, if you need them. And then again, just double checking the quality and size of the images that you're using. So nothing worse than a really poor quality image to take away from your graphical abstract. <clears throat> so that leads us into some of the graphic design tips and tricks that'll just help that uh, graphical abstract be a little more pleasing to the eye. So starting with a grid is a great way of keeping everything in line, nice and even on the image. There's usually an option for this in many different programs. And again, quick Google search if you're unsure um, or on PowerPoint. I don't know if you can see me adding it now, but it's super, super simple to add those grid lines in the background. Less is more. So again, trying to avoid information overload. You don't want to overwhelm your viewer. Um, avoiding clutter, simplifying when possible. And this is when it can really help to have more time. So trying not to rush the creation of this graphical abstract, which I know is easier said than done. Um, but if you do have the time to let yourself step back for a day or two, don't look at it at all and then come back to it, you're gonna see things that you didn't before and um, think of different ways of doing things. So creating a hierarchy of information as well. Um, so kind of goes right along with the less is more. Um, but using as few words as possible, starting with the title, uh, maybe your subheadings, and then one to two lines of text where you can. So really trying to bring the viewer through with that hierarchy. Trying to create a nice visual balance between the content and white space. And ensuring contrast between the text and the background. Um, so lots of different combinations that work really well, lots that don't. So just being mindful of that. If you find that you have to squint, probably need to change a color. Um, and again, just use, making sure that your images are high resolution. So let's assume now that you have your finished graphical abstract. You've gone through everything. You've worked through multiple drafts um, and have landed on that final product. So sharing this graphical abstract on social media is a great way to draw more attention to your journal, journal article or to reach a slightly different audience than you might with your journal publication alone. Um, so for example, maybe you are trying to reach people, reach a more lay audience and plan to use that graphical abstract online to do so. Um, so first and foremost, consider where online your knowledge users or your audience is. So what social media sites are they going to be on? How can you most easily or efficiently reach them? And then with that, what kind of image is likely to catch their attention? And will your graphical abstract, as it is right now, accomplish this? So this is why it's so crucial to think about your knowledge users or your audience ahead of time so that you can tailor your graphical abstract to them as you're going. So keep coming back to this thought of your audience and what's going to work for them. But this isn't always feasible, or maybe it wasn't in your original plans to share online. Um, in this case, you could always consider making that infographic or a poster, something with different, a kind of different take on things um, that'll do a better job of reaching that target audience. And then depending on the um, site that you're going to use, there's different dimensions that are ideal. 
Um, so these are in pixels. So you can see Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn are there. Um, Instagram too, not on there, but that one I believe is 1200 by 1200. Um, so just to keep in mind when you are sharing things on there, um, also, we're thinking of like thumbnails too. I know like on the mobile Twitter app, if you, you're just scrolling by, you don't always see the entire image until you click on it. So being mindful of what your viewers are going to see when they first scroll by and what's going to make them click on it to see the whole thing. Um, you can definitely use hashtags to your advantage too, to increase the visibility. Um, or in this, on the same breath, are there any accounts that you could tag that might be willing to retweet or post or repost what you're sharing? Um, even institutional accounts that might be able to share something for you to, with a broader reach. <clears throat> Making use of your caption too. This could be a really great spot to fill in any blanks. Um, so maybe your graphical abstract was originally for a more academic audience but you could use that caption online to kind of explain things a little more um, and paint the fuller picture. And again, being mindful of plain language, if you're gonna target a lay audience, um, we don't have to get into the issue of misinformation, It'd be way too long, but we know that it can be a huge issue when things are interpreted wrong. Um, so just keeping that in mind with the kind of language that you're using and how you're um, portraying your results and your graphical abstract. So um, kind of a busy slide here, but wanted to walk you through an example. Um, and this is one, it's not in the sport field, so I'm sorry about that. Um, this is like my area, more my area of research, which is periodontal disease. Um, so gum disease. <clears throat> and this is a paper on treating periodontal disease and protein intake. Um, so I'm not gonna waste your time going through the abstract. I'm gonna show you kind of what I cut out from that after but starting with the journal requirements. So this paper was submitted to Nutrients. And do you wanna say this isn't a real graph, it wasn't a published graphical abstract, it's just one that I created for the sake of having an example. Um, but the journal requirements from Nutrients were basically just this. So it needs to represent the article topic in an attention grabbing way, shouldn't be the same as a figure in the paper, and it should be original and unpublished artwork. So it listed some acceptable file formats when you are submitting it. And then it even gave specific fonts that were okay to use. So clear and easy to read. And then a minimum size, um, 560 by 1100 pixels. So a lot of freedom you can see, like there are some technical requirements, but in terms of what can actually be in the graphical abstract, a lot is just on me. So again, here we have the written abstract. And then this is what I'm gonna focus on for my graphical abstract. Um, so the first line you can see, the aim of the study is to determine whether a relationship between periodontal healing and protein intake existed. And then down below was the kind of key finding that I took out of this. So this would be my SMIT, my single most important thing, uh, which is that consuming more than one gram of protein per kilogram body weight per day was associated with a reduction in disease burden. So what was, I was also trying to think of what was unique about this study that I might wanna highlight. And I think one thing would be that the, that main finding was only present in non-smokers. So that's something that I might definitely wanna highlight in my graphical abstract. And then another unique element was that protein is really not well researched in this area at, well, at, at, at all. Um, so something that I might want to try and include if I can, or to really highlight this, this emphasis on protein. Um, so I was trying to figure out which program I wanted to use to create this. And this is a chart um, that again comes from our modules with the VPMI. We have a worksheet that goes along with it um, that'll walk you through step-by-step -step creating your graphical abstract. Um, so this is where the chart came from but I decided that I wanted to use Canva um, because I know with um, infographics that I've created before, it has the kind of icons and symbols that I need for this. Um, and I already kind of know how to use it. So I don't have to go through this big learning curve. So just a quick recap. So I have my research question. I have, I know what I want my readers to take away from this article. And then I was trying to think of elements that I might want to include. 
So I might want to mention the sample size, um, some of the main methods that were used. Um, so food, food frequency questionnaires, and then maybe mention what statistical analyses, and then the key results, of course. <clears throat> so this was kind of my first draft. Um, I knew I wanted to go with panels to try and focus on my research question, the methods, and then really using the bulk of it, though, to focus on the key findings. Um, so stepped back for a while. And then before getting back into it, some things I kind of asked myself. So is it portraying the key message that I wanted to? And would this message be easily identifiable to a first time viewer? Um, have my co-authors reviewed and provided feedback? Can I reduce the use of text at all? So can I get rid of some of this um, to simplify things? Am I overstating any findings or results? Really important not to overstate your findings, just what what was found um, without going into too, too much detail um, that's going to be more in the discussion portion. Ultimately, am I happy with the final product? And is the graphical abstract that I'm submitting in line with the technical specifications from the journal? So my final, final product ended up looking like this. Um, and I tried to highlight the protein intake there tried to minimize text. Um, obviously, far from perfect, there's still things that I would change. Um, but again, trying to incorporate that key finding or my SMIT. Um, yeah, so that would be that would be my example. Um, otherwise, thank you guys so much for coming um, and participating. If there's any questions or anything more that you want to discuss or share. And then again, just going to plug the modules, of course. Yes, yeah, so we'll make sure we'll get it to Kyle when they're out because they're going to be very, very good when they're out. Uh, I also want to note you had a Smith and a Blam in that um, graphical abstract. Larissa <laughs> gave an actual message around what people should do, right? Uh, I like that. Oh, we've got a question. Uh, what changes did you make in your final draft compared to the first draft? Um, so hard to see with this because I had done, so the first draft, the second was more just aesthetic that I'm showing here because I'm so somebody that did everything by hand. Like I had this entire thing almost mapped out on many, many, many pieces of paper, scrap notes that all just ended up getting thrown out. I wasn't going to waste time trying to have people decipher my chicken scratch. Um, but starting with kind of knowing that I wanted to show this relationship, um, trying to like the research question. So the relationship between periodontal healing and protein intake, how can I say that in as few words as possible so that it's still clear what I'm looking at? Um, and then the methods, I wasn't sure exactly how much detail I wanted to go into, ended up just stating because thinking if this was going to be a journal submission, I'm probably not going to be trying to target a lay audience. So people in this like nutritional area are going to know what the FFQ stands for already. I don't need to explain that. Don't need to simplify multiple linear regression anymore because I'm targeting a more academic audience. Um, so things like that, that kind of tweaked and just required a lot of thought beforehand, I guess. And I think the rest of that point that you made that you made like a thousand drafts on paper is really important. Every time that I would strongly recommend start with a piece of paper, even if you're not like, I'm not an artist. I always start with a piece of paper and I actually start with words. What's my story? What am I trying to say? And I say the words I want to, and then I see what visuals can I tie to that? Um, and I find that's a little bit easier for those of us in the world that are less visually and design inclined hand up because that's me. Um, Emily, I see you put your hand up. Yeah, just a quick question. Do you have an example of a graphical abstract and infographic from the same material to kind of show the differences between like the more academic output for a nuanced audience versus like a lay audience? I don't. I have one. Well, I guess I have one um, similar. Let me pull it up. So I also did an infographic on periodontal disease and plant-based diet. So it's not that protein relationship, but I can show you the difference. You see like what the graphical abstract looks like versus how much detail, more detail I went into for the infographic. 
just bear with me one moment. I'll pull that up. It seems like it'd be like a good exercise for someone who's like practicing doing this, right? Yeah. Kind of oh, one for, for sure. Yeah. I have a super quick question while you're looking. Um, did you pull all of those little icons from Canva? Were those ones all already in there? Those ones were, some were from Canva, some were from PowerPoint. The online image search where you can, you can, keep um, Creative Commons checked off so that you know they're okay to use. So yeah, for this presentation, I was more PowerPoint. I also would like to tell, oh, this is just gonna like make you all even more scared of drawing. It's actually really easy to make icons. Like if you've got to make some stick figures, like that's just a couple little like squares and some circles. I promise you, I've, I am not visually inclined by any means. But like I've made my own little icons of like people slipping and tripping and falling when I used to work in injury prevention. I can make one heck of a car now, Emily, uh, that would work for your road safety. <laughs> and they're quite easy to make with just like little like squares and circles and stuff. Okay, so I don't know if you guys can see that. This is an example. This is an infographic that I did. Um, so not on the sa exact same topic, but on plant-based diets and periodontal disease. Um, so you can see way, way more text. Um, tried to give a lot more background information. So like 70, the st statistics at the top here, 70% of Canadians are affected by gum disease. Um, untreated, this is what it leads to, which is things that I, they're probably things I wouldn't focus on on a graphical abstract because it's not directly related to that specific study. Um, plant-based eating, just some general benefits as well that have been noted. Um, so a lot more general, there's a lot, some more actionable steps that I've given at the bottom here as well. Um, so you can kind of see the difference there because this wasn't on just one specific study. It was the culmination of a lot of different literature. So I hope that helps a little, the difference with infographics and graphical abstracts. It does, yeah. And um, Laura, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, I'm just curious, what do you recommend just because you are creating a, an original image, do you just like put your name on the bottom to kind of show authorship? Or is there like a best practice for that? You definitely could if you want at the bottom. It definitely I don't think it's necessary. If you're publishing with it a, with a journal article, um, it's going to be linked to your article already, so you don't have to. Um, but I think that would totally be the author's call. There's not really yeah. set guidelines. I can jump in really quick, uh, Laurel. I would always say put something that ties it back to you. Um, I always explain to people like you're not going to poof into the ether when someone picks up this material, and you don't know once you put it out there many people could get, get it right. And you want somehow that they've like, Hey, this is interesting. How do I circle back? So I mm -hmm. recommend at the bottom of any graphic that you're making your name, potentially like an email that, you know, will like you'll have. And if you've got any social media that you use professionally, like your Twitter or something, just even if it's like a little strip at the bottom uh, mm -hmm. and you can use the icon for like, um, like the email icon and like the little Twitter icon. So they know what, what they are strongly recommend just so it's there. And then you have it, and like you own your own IP as a, as a student and as a faculty member. So it's still yours, but you just want to have that in case someone wants to reach out and it can always relate back to you. Right. Okay. No problem. Awesome. Well, um, I'm sure we're happy to stick around and chat with people if they'd like, uh, but I'll take this opportunity to thank Jane and Larissa for pulling this together. Um, give you a, a little virtual round of applause there. Uh, from all of us. This was really interesting. Uh, super helpful to think about, um, you know, the different ways to design that stuff. I really appreciated you breaking it down for us and, and uh, walking us through those steps. So thank you so much.